Welcome. It's great to have you here. We're in the series called B. And uh, last week we talked about um, being still, to just sit there. Don't do anything, just sit there. And this week, uh, we looked at Psalm 37 last week. This week, we're looking at both 1 Timothy 6 and Hebrews 13. And the idea today, the focus is on being content. Um, As I stated uh, last week, you know, the beginning of a new year, we often have kind of New Year's resolutions, uh, things that we're going to try to do this year or things that we're going to try to accomplish that we didn't quite get around to or are struggling with last year. How many of you get uh, write down to-do lists? Do you have to-do lists? Yeah. How many of you have honey-do lists? You don't know what a honey-do list is? Honey, will you do... Honey-do list. Um, How many of you have a to-be list? Hmm. Yeah, you do. Awesome. And that's what we're kind of focusing on. We're human beings, not human doings. And for most of the time when you ask, in five years from now, I would like to be, uh, what we really aren't saying is what I'd like to be. We're saying what I'd like to have done you know, in five years, Um, you know, and so we're looking at more of the being side of things because out of our being comes our doing, according to the scriptures. Out of who we are then turns into what we're able to do. Jesus would say it in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere, a good tree produces good fruit. You can staple oranges to a pine tree, but it doesn't make it an orange tree. Do you understand? You can duct tape them. You could do whatever you want. It's not going to change. But out of who we are, out of the fact that we are now new creatures in Christ, we are able to then, because who we are, we are able to then do things that actually are pleasing to God and serve this world. So today, we're looking at being content. Wow, yeah, you you might be at this point going like, yeah, that's one I don't want to hear about. Uh, Because we struggle with this. In fact, when I was studying this series, I found out, you know, kind of I sometimes look up quotes on being content. There are thousands of quotes on this subject of contentment, and they go all the way back as far as writing goes, and the struggle human beings have had on contentment. For example, Socrates said, he who is not contented with what he has would not be contented with what he would like to have. But I'll tell you this, this is what I, uh, um, and we're struggling with today, is you can talk about contentment, you can even understand what it is, but it doesn't make you content. You know, that's the question. If contentment was just a matter of simply choosing contentment, we probably all would get there at some point in life. (laughs) But do you find contentment by hearing a lecture on contentment, reading a book on contentment, disciplining yourself to be more, uh, or to uh, lecture to yourself about how much you already have? or by meditating and trying to let go and detach yourself from the need for things, how is it that one finds contentment? And Paul said it this way in the letter to the Philippians, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So whatever situation he's in, he has learned to be content. Notice Paul had to learn this. It's something that he didn't just naturally do, You don't naturally find contentment. But my question is still, how did Paul learn it? Because I haven't quite mastered that yet by any means. So today we're going to be reading both 1 Timothy 6, uh, scattered throughout this, because the word contentment comes up there, as well as Hebrews 13. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember, those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. 
For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my help, helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So from this passage and for Timothy 6, we're going to explore these three points. How being discontent is a trap. What contentment actually is, and then what contentment actually brings with it. All right? So how being discontent is a trap. Did you notice uh, Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your life free from the love of money. Free? Wait a minute. You mean, I always thought money brought freedom. And Paul is, or Hebrews is saying, no, pursuing money as your goal in life is a trap. In fact, in 1 Timothy 6, he says this way, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, that's the word for trap, into many senseless and harmful desires. So it isn't that money is the problem, it's the pursuit of it, it's the tempt, and how easily you can fall into it. And Paul uses the word for snare here, pagus, which is a trap or a snare for catching birds. By the way, you know, when you try to snare a bird, I've never done that, but you know, the idea is the bird doesn't realize it's a trap until it's too late, right? That's kind of what a trap is. So you bait the trap with a lot of food, and so the bird doesn't see it, but before you know it, the bird is snared. Um, I couldn't help myself. So <laughs> it just reminds me of one of my teen, favorite teen movies, uh, where in Star Wars, it just says this. Click it. It's a trap. It's a trap. Do you remember that? Did you ever see that? It's, it's kind of a meme all over. It's a trap. You don't know it's a trap until it's too late. And in fact, the problem with money is not, you, even when you're in the trap, you don't realize it's a trap. Paul says that um, it causes us to plunge us into senseless and harmful things. So the word for senseless is anotes, which is basically the Greek word for being foolish or thoughtless or mindless. And so you're in the middle of it. You're pursuing it. You're pursuing it. You're pursuing it. And you don't even realize it's happening. Paul is kind of falling into, um, well, exactly a, a Hebrew tradition throughout the Old Testament into the New of wisdom literature that understands that being a fool is not about intelligence. It's not about how smart you are. But being a fool is how unteachable you are. <laughs> how in denial you are. How easy to, th th how much you think you already understand and know. And when it comes to pursuing treasures and pleasures and things in this world, we think we know. We think we know what we want. I'll tell you, you try to figure out what you really want sometime. If anybody has ever asked you that question, whether it's in a counseling session or what is it that you really want, you try to figure that one out. It's amazing how it's like, wait a minute, well, I think I want, but... Do I really want it? And when you get it, does it really satisfy? So, so often people will focus on what they think they want, but I don't know what I really want or what I really need. I don't realize what's making me restless. I don't understand what's really behind it all and how <coughs> foolish it is that I think the more money I have, the happier I will be. Money does not bring contentment. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, he puts it this way, um, how money can distort things. He says, as for the rich in this present age, notice he has no problem with people having wealth. But he says this, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides with everything to enjoy. 
then the word here that says haughty, try, charge them not to be haughty or arrogant, is hupsolofreno, which is basically the word to mean you get a big head. Okay, lofrain is the, the phrenology is head, and the idea is um, hyper head, <laughs> mega head, big head. Here's the deal. <clears throat> The gospel of Jesus Christ, you are saved by God's grace through faith. Nothing that you've done, nothing that you've earned, nothing that you think, nothing that you are has brought it. It's all a free gift of God. But my default in life is to want to justify myself rather than receive God's justification in Christ. That is, I want to find my worth and my value and my identity and what I accomplish or think or do. And then when I become more successful, when I get the promotion, when I get more money, when I am able to move up the socioeconomic ladder a couple of rungs, all of a sudden my default mechanism kicks in and, and I start saying, oh, look at this, my economic condition means my social condition and my status in life is higher, and that also turns into my moral condition. I think somehow it inflates everything. I get a big head and think, look at me. I'm making more money. I must be a better person. And those people who aren't, well, something's wrong with them. They must be, can you think of what things I would project on others? Lazy incompetent, not as smart. Somehow, being wealthy <laughs> becomes my status symbol of somehow I have a better relationship with God as a result. And none of that necessarily is true. True, wealth is a gift from God. But I am justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. No wonder why Bernard of Clairvaux said it this way, to see a man humble under prosperity is the greatest rarity in the world. Uh, you can look at the headlines in our, uh, the wealthy people that you know in our society right now, and I don't see a lot of humility. Do you? Yeah. Well, you might say, well, thank God I'm not rich. The pursuit of money not necessarily having it is the problem. It doesn't take away the fact that money, uh, the pursuit of money can actually poison, whether it's in the absence or in your presence, because it's so easy for me to then turn the lack of having as many resources as somebody else into envy for them, and all of a sudden my life is now all wrapped up in our self-pity of, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm working hard, and you know, all of that type of stuff. Isn't it amazing how we just do it? And that's why Paul says to Timothy that pursuing more money doesn't lead to contentment, but instead it can lead to your ruin. And if money doesn't give you contentment, then what is it in the first place? Our second point. And in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Paul says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. And those words great gain is mega, mega wealth. You want, you want something that really is rich? Have godliness and contentment. And the word contentment actually is autocrea. It is the, um, the highest, by the way. It was for ancient Greek philosophers, it was the highest virtue to attain. For them, though, the word really meant self-sufficiency, self being ruling over yourself, being independent, mastering yourself, not having anything else in charge. And we can see in our society as well, we're trying to always be independent of everyone else and, and self-contained. I just always have found it funny, what is it, uh, the Bush people of Alaska reality show, 
and they talk about their independence and they're out in the middle of nowhere and they're able to do it all and yet you see they have a chainsaw that somebody else created and gave to them. They, and they have a boat and they have all of these other things that they have had to be dependent upon the rest of society before they can venture off on their own and become a self-made individual out in the middle of nowhere. But that's our ideal. And we think the more money we have, the more independent I can be of other people, and the more self-contained. And our technology is the same. The more technology I have, the more I don't have to depend. I can just ask Google. Siri's my helper now. I can stare into a screen all day long, and we are more anxious and lonely and depressed and isolated than ever before, pursuing Autarkia. But Paul uses this word, and his definition is a bit different. He didn't believe a human being was made to be independent or self sufficient or self contained. In fact, that was the temptation from Adam and Eve on to take it on ourselves, to own it. I want your stuff, God. I just don't want you, and I want to do it my way. That's the problem. Paul knows no one is truly independent. In fact, autoarchaea, according to Paul, is being in a right relationship with God where we realize our dependence and need for him and that we can rest in that. Psalm 131 is a psalm I would love for you to look up some point in time. It's a great psalm about this whole feeling, and it says, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child against his mother's bosom. You know how a, a baby, at the moment, this is a good time to say this, right? How we have little Melody here, and uh, we have Glenna here, right? And how you just have them in your lap, and they're just at peace and at rest because they can depend on and trust without any need. Every need is being met. That is what Paul says is contentment. Hebrews puts it this way in our, our reading. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Wonderful English translation, that last phrase, I will never leave you or forsake you, except for the fact that there's actually five negatives in this statement. It's the, I will never, ever, ever leave you. I will never, never forsake you. Never, ever. <laughs> That God says, there is no way ever, 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 ever that I would ever leave you or forsake you. I am always with you. And how do we know that? Hebrews in 13, chapter 13 would say, it's because Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. It's Hebrews' way of saying Jesus is the one who was forsaken. He went outside of the city of Jerusalem upon a hill and there forsaken by God and for every one of his friends and treated and castigated and cast off from the world, suspended between earth and heaven itself. He alone is the forsaken one. He is the one who had nothing to his name. And he is the one who offers his entire life up to his father for your sake. So that God, at that moment, can confirm, I will never, 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 never forsake you. Jonathan Edwards, who was um, an early uh, American preacher, already at the age of 18, wrote a sermon on contentment. I'm amazed at that. And in it, he basically understands the fact that we can be content because of this never, 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 ever promise of God. And he said, these are the three things that result from the fact that God is with us always, that God will be with us always, and God will uh, have us in eternity with him. He says, your bad things in life actually can turn out for your good. 
The good things can't be taken away from you. And the best things are still yet to come. Think about that. Do you realize that that's what God's promise really is? The bad things that you've experienced, they turn out for good. Paul would say, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. And he says, you know, I'm in prison right now, but this bad is turning out for my good. And the good isn't really taken away from me. I have God's presence. I can sing and rejoice in jail. God is with me. I have a deep meaning and purpose in life. I have a mission. I have a calling. Oh, yeah, I've gone through a lot of heartache. But God has never abandoned me. And Paul would say, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. The good is yet to come. Now, John, you might say to me, wait a minute, Paul's life? I don't want that. Imprisonment, beating, shipwrecked, hunger. Holy cow. But Paul would look at you, I think, and me and say, you know what, though? This is what contentment brings. This is what contentment brings. Hebrews 13 says it this way. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And thereby some have entertained angels. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you are also in one body. You kind of like get this laundry list of items. They aren't to-do lists necessarily. They're more to-be lists in Hebrews 13, that includes being content knowing God has never forsaken you. And you wonder, how do these all fit together? And what's fascinating here is at the beginning, it says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality. Two words, Philadelphia. You've heard that before, probably, the city. It's a city of brotherly love. It is the fact that one is loved. And philozenia. That is the love of those different. The love of those who are similar to you, the love of those who are different from you. In other words, one of the things when you are content, when you realize God has provided everything you need, when you were the stranger, he has welcomed you in. When he was the one who loved those very different from him. Do you realize Jesus was absolutely perfect and holy, and yet who did he hang out with? Sinners and publicans people who are totally different than him. Because Jesus has welcomed you in, you can welcome others in. You know, so often we think hospitality is about, you know, well, it's a major at FGCU, hospitality management, it's about vacations, it's about experiences, it's about enjoyment. No. Hospitality at the time of Jesus, was a necessity. Because if you ever traveled anywhere, there wasn't Booking.com or Airbnb. There weren't even a lot of hotels or other options. You were at the mercy of someone to welcome you into their home. For Christians, William Lane writes, A delight in the guest host relationship reflects the expectation that God will play a significant role in the ordinary exchange between guests and hosts. This lends to hospitality a sacramental quality. Paul is saying welcome in those who are different than you. Welcome in those who are the same as you. You want to find contentment in life? Guess where you will do that? In Christian fellowship, in eating together, in having community together. If you're wondering, why is it that I'm not that content with my life right now? I'm wondering if you haven't realized that God has given you wealth in your relationships or the possibility of them. It's not about how much money you have in the bank, but how God has provided you brothers and sisters in Christ who are very similar to you and maybe their values and thoughts or very different from you, and yet the unity that you have is in Jesus. You want a rich life? Then invite other people into yours. That's what Paul would say. Do you understand God's grace more deeply? Then share it with others. Do you want to make an impact on others and in this world? Then open yourself up 
to others, both with time and space. You see, um, when we practice hospitality, as John Piper says, here's what happens. We experience the refreshing joy of becoming conduits of God's hospitality rather than being self-decaying cul-de-sacs. Rather than just sitting there going like, I need more, I need more, I need more from God. When I share and give, then all of a sudden there's a joy in that. And there's a depth in that. And you realize that you are interconnected with others, interdependent as God has intended you to be. And Rosario Butterfield writes that radical ordinary hospitality shows a skeptical post-Christian world authentic Christianity and what it looks like. You want to see what it looks like? It looks like taking time for somebody to listen to them, spending time with them opening yourself up to them, serving, giving. Christine Pohl um, wrote probably the classics book. I think this was her doctorate. She wrote on Christian hospitality and how different it was and how it's changed over the ages and uh, how important it was in the early church and even into the middle evil ages. And she says it this way, we offer hospitality within the context of knowing Jesus as both our greater host and our potential guest. The grace we experience in receiving Jesus' welcome energizes our hospitality while it undermines our pride and self-righteousness. The possibility of welcoming Christ as our guest strengthens our kindness and fortitude in responding to strangers. You will not find security by pursuing money. You won't find comfort by buying it at some store. You won't discover meaning by searching online. It's when we, as the body of Christ, this is why we've said from the beginning of Thrive, relationships are everything. Our relationship with God, our relationship with others. This is why one of our other taglines has been, you belong. Because that's what God has said. You want a rich life? It's going to be with others. I don't care if you're an introvert or an extrovert. It's not about that. It's not about the number, necessarily. It's about the quality and depth of the life that God has given you. So maybe, just maybe today, there's a million different ways to have hospitality with others. But maybe hang out 5 o'clock. You know? And it's really when we're hanging out with each other, we're seeing people that we're going to be with for eternity. And we're celebrating the fact that God has brought us together in Christ. No other agenda needed. This is God's world. He made us in his image to reflect his goodness and glory and to love one another as he has loved us. You want contentment? You're going to find it in relationships. You're not going to find it in anything else. So let's be the people of God. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you for this uh, time. Uh, help us with our be list this year, Lord, rather than our to-do list. Make us, conform us to be more like your son, Jesus. One day you are going to conform us to his image, as Romans 8 states. And your whole purpose and intent is to help us to be more and more fully human and fully giving and fully receiving. For you have honored us with such glory and that we would be your image, Lord. That we would be loved by you. And that we would be able to be present for each other and to present you to each other and to be still before you, to receive from you, and to be content by being a part of a fellowship where we can share lives together. Thank you, Lord, for all of these things. Lord, as we move into a time of uh, offering and a time of preparation for the Lord's Supper today, we just pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, that um, our contentment would overflow into great openness and vulnerability to one another. We pray that you would bless us so that we could be a blessing to others, not as an end in itself to just have stuff, 
but to actually have, um, to, to live out the community that you intend us to be. Lord, we lift up to you today many people who are going through some really tough times. You know in our area, we are nowhere near over the, uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. People are still trying to rebuild um, proper shelters. We're struggling, oh Lord, with affordable housing, with food, with other things. Lord, we ask that you'd help us at Thrive in whatever small way we can uh, be, Lord, for you. The conduits of your love and mercy and hospitality to others, whether it's in giving uh, food, in giving time, in serving, uh, in, in helping come alongside of people, Lord. We also lift up all those who are facing illness. We know so many in our, our um, area right now, Lord, who are struggling, Lord, with health. We're still, Lord, seeing COVID spread. We're still seeing, Lord, RSV and the flu and all sorts of issues, Lord, with just who knows what, right? And uh, we pray that you bring your healing and that we could be your healing presence in the lives of others, Lord, and just show a little of your mercy more. We pray for 2023, Lord, that this would be the year that we would be yours, that we would be still before you, that we would be content, that we would be thankful, that we would be loved, that we would be present. Lord, make this year's yours, our lives are in your hand. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.